everybody. I'm Dennis Prager. This is my home. And hello, as I remind you each week at what we call my fireside chat. It's a real fireside. It's a real chat. Everything about it is real. There's nothing scripted. Just a chance to offer you some thoughts, take your questions, and as it were, enjoy each other. And I think about the opening topic each week. And by the way, I do have to mention, for those of you who've missed, I guess, the last eight or so, I have been forbidden to have my cigar, which I had the first 40 or so chats, because Facebook feels that it corrupts the youth. So we could not promote it on Facebook. And I have offered my thoughts on that, on how much less free a country we live in than when I was a kid. It's, it's a very sad thing to me because it was a big part of the chat. It gave it a real informal sense and a sense of the real and my relaxation. But it is what it is. I'm just noting it. Given the Thanksgiving period that we're in, I thought I would talk to you about what could arguably be my favorite subject. Oh, let's put it this way. I don't have a more favorite subject. There may be subjects tied for first place. This might be, uh, this would certainly be one of them. And that is gratitude. Gratitude is so important that I am about to offer you a thought that if you take it seriously, is completely life-changing. Here it goes. The mother of happiness is gratitude, and the mother of goodness is gratitude. In fact, that in many ways is what links happiness with goodness. So if you have happiness here and goodness here, and they go up, there's like an Olympic ring that attaches the two at this point of gratitude. It's so powerful gratitude that it is not possible to be happy if you are not grateful, and it is not possible to be a good person if you are not grateful. That cannot be said about any other thing with regard to both happiness and goodness. There are other important aspects to goodness and to happiness, but nothing is this link. That's how important it is. And it's, it's, we not only don't live in an age that inspires uh, people, especially young people, but not just young people to be grateful. It inspires ingratitude. This is a first in American history, maybe even in some ways world history, where a, a generation is being raised to be ungrateful. This is astonishing. It, it is therefore, it guarantees, and, and I mean it, it guarantees, it guarantees that a lot of people will not be kind and a lot of people will not be happy. What's an example? I'll go back to gratitude in a moment. What is an example of being raised to be ungrateful? Well, the way in which Americans are taught about America. There's no reason to be grateful to be an American. Why would you be grateful to be uh, something that not only is no better than any other thing, but in fact is, is filled with racism and sexism and uh, oppression and homophobia and xenophobia? Why would you be happy to be an American? Whew. Especially if you are a woman or a black or a Latino, or an Asian, uh, did I miss anybody? Oh, or gay? Oh my God, you, you, just, you just are oppressed. When I speak at colleges and some member of one of those groups gets up at a microphone and says, are you saying that we are, my, my group, whatever it might be, we, uh, we women are not oppressed? I say, not oppressed? You're the luckiest women in the history of femaledom. What, are you kidding? you got to be joking. Oppressed? Women in America are oppressed? What the hell is wrong with you? What did you do, go to college? And then I realize I'm at a college. <laughs> uh, you have to learn. See, this is the amazing thing. You have to learn to be grateful, but in some cases you have to be learned to be ungrateful. 
<laughs> That's the irony here. We are teaching young people to be miserable, literally miserable in both senses, misery and not nice. No one who is ungrateful is nice. It does, it's not possible. Ingra- just as gratitude is the mother of goodness and, and, and uh, happiness, ingratitude is the mother of cruelty and sadness. It's, it, it actually angers me, as you could tell. <laughs> I do. I'm, I'm upset by it. I, I walk around every day. I, am, I can't believe how lucky I am. Of course, there's an answer that uh, our uh, mis- misery-making left uh, will say, well, of course, you're white. Well, then, if being white would guarantee you happiness and gratitude... Why are white males, supposedly the one group that is not oppressed, why they have the highest percentage of suicides in the United States? Hmm, wonder why. Maybe because the point is idiotic. What do you think, every white person is walking around grateful? Not if they're on the left, they're not. (laughs) Believe me, that's the whole point of being on the left. I'm grateful for what? Their health? That's good. That's, That's good. By the way, that's a start. I, I know how bad the human condition is. I know it because I'm a Jew, and I, uh, that's one reason. It's not the only reason. You don't have to be a Jew to know how bad the human condition is, but it's certainly one of them. I grew up after the Holocaust, but I knew damn well about it. I, I, I went to synagogue with Holocaust survivors, people with tattoos, the numbers the Nazis tattooed on their arms. They were common sights in, in, my, in my synagogue growing up in New York. And what the, these people, most of these people lost virtually every relative. Spouses, children, parents, cousins, brothers, sisters. Gassed, shot, tortured, raped, murdered in every other way. I'm, I'm well aware of how bad the world is. You don't have to be a Jew, as I said, to know how bad it is. But uh, it, it comes with the territory at least the way uh, the, the time that I grew up and the awareness of the, of the Holocaust. But, I mean, you've got to be pretty ignorant to not know how bad it is in much of human history and in, in, in the world today in so many places. And then you're not grateful to be an American? Or, by the way, many of you listen all over the world. A lot of you should be grateful in, in many of your countries. Not just Americans should be grateful. I'm speaking as an American because I'm an American. I mean, I don't know where, wherever you might be watching, whatever country you might be, I don't know if they're teaching you to be ungrateful like uh, people are being taught in the United States. So I, I can speak about the country I know best, the United States of America. If you are any of the groups I mentioned, you are very, very lucky to be in this country. Gay, Hispanic, Asian, Female, black. Very, very lucky. And if you see yourself as oppressed, I, I condemn those who taught you that drivel, that, that destructive nonsense, and you are, con- you are letting yourself be condemned to a life of anger and misery and, and, and by the way, meanness. Because if you aren't grateful, if you're un- in ungrateful, you will act it out. It is inevitable. That's why I said gratitude is the mother of goodness. Ingratitude is the mother of, of, uh, of non-goodness. You know, you know why the Germans elected Hitler? Because they were so, so resentful of, of being oppressed. They were so ungrateful for their situation. Oh, the, the Versailles Treaty, what it, it, what it did to us. Because they saw themselves as victims. Anyone who sees him or herself as a victim is by definition an ungrateful human being. Nobody is grateful for being a victim, right? Right, that's definitional. So being taught that you are a victim ensures you, uh, you will have a miserable life. It's, it's an, it ensures it. So uh, <laughs> this is a pretty important subject, gratitude. And it doesn't come naturally, gratitude. It just doesn't. That's why parents, good parents, say to their kids, I I would I would love to know the number. Nobody knows the number, but I bet you the average parent has said to their child or their children, 
more than 10,000 times. Say thank you. I'm sure it's in the vicinity of 10,000. Now, why is that? Why wouldn't telling your child once say thank you if someone has done something good to you? Why wouldn't that suffice? Because we're not naturally grateful. Human nature, being pretty, pretty, pretty not so good, is not naturally grateful. You've got to learn gratitude. Isn't that amazing? You have to learn gratitude. You have to learn almost everything good. You don't have to learn ingratitude. Ingratitude comes naturally. But gratitude has to be learned and it has to be renewed. You have to keep the gratitude. If somebody does something very kind to, to you or for you, you are grateful and you may be grateful even for 24 hours. But after a week, that's why my favorite book, because it teaches wisdom and without wisdom, you have no chance at a good life is the Bible, and uh, there's this terrific story, of course, the Hebrews, Israelites, they're enslaved in Egypt, they're taken out of Egypt to be free people, and the first thing they do after attaining freedom is complain. That's basically much of what the middle of the first five books of the Bible is about. The Hebrews, Israelites, Jews, whatever term you wish to use, complaining about their situation in fact to the point where at one point they said we want to go back to egypt at least we had good meat there you rather be a slave with me wait you rather be a slave with meat than a a free person with manna that's that's something which proves another thing people don't yearn for freedom that's a common misconception we don't yearn for much that's good we have everything good is a value values need to be learned And gratitude is a value. So you should think right now, whom are you grateful to? Be an interesting question. Right right this moment, think, whom are you grateful to? What are you grateful to? You may not have a big list, which is pretty unfortunate. So gratitude has to be fostered. And you have to remember who did you something good. You can't let it, you can't let it become... What have you done for me lately? That's a big deal. That's how people's attitude towards God. That was, that's the case in, uh, in, in the book of Exodus. They, you know, basically what, what, you know, there you did all these miracles to get us out of Egypt, but what have you done for me in in the past week? Nothing. (laughs) That's human nature. That's why I love the, uh, the Bible, it's brilliant. I have always cultivated gratitude, and it's one of the reasons I'm a happy guy. And I even might offer the possibility, maybe I'm a nice guy. It's gratitude, that's the secret. I, When people have done me something good, I remember it forever. I make sure to remember it forever. I got a letter, you know, it's one of the great teachers of my life has been being a public figure for almost all my adult life. And I have gotten mail for decades from people. I read a lot of it, can't respond to all of it, can't even read all of it, but I read a lot of it. So here is an email I got this past week. Somebody wrote me, I think from Ohio, a woman wrote to me and said, I have been listening to you for over 20 years, and now I will not listen to you anymore. I get that type of letter regularly. I mean, it's, it's, I'm not, I don't want to, oh, I don't want to exaggerate in any way. It's not every single day, but I get it regularly. I, I, you know, I used to enjoy you. I, I, I can no longer listen to you. What happens I mean, first of all, if she was telling the truth that she's listened to me for 20 years, I think I have earned her gratitude. Is that fair? Unless she's a masochist, why would she listen to me for 20 years unless she was benefiting from hearing me? Right? Right. Okay. So why is she not? She found out that uh, she, uh, she, uh, somebody inquired about my giving a speech they were told by my staff that I uh, that I charge a fee for speaking, 
and she now no longer will listen to me. Now, it's so, the whole thing is so interesting. I, I, what does she think that I can only speak for free? I give a lot of free speeches, but obviously for me to go to Ohio means, let's say my speech is on Wednesday. So I have to leave on Tuesday and then broadcast from Ohio on Wednesday, then give my speech Wednesday night, then, then broadcast on Thursday, noon to three Eastern time and then make a late flight back on Thursday. So I am gone Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday to give one talk in Ohio. So I should leave my home for three days for nothing. Otherwise, I am unworthy of being listened to. Now, my point, and I'm being so open with you about the letter and about my life because it's such a good example. How how is it possible that her she her mind didn't go well you know he makes a living too or it's a long trip it you know i'm not asking him to stop by his radio studio in la this is across the country uh and anyway i'm so grateful to him for all the good he's done uh am i gonna stop listening am i gonna get angry that's what she should have thought i'm not hurt believe me I, none of this stuff hurts me i'm telling you the story because the woman was incapable of weighing all the good that I have done in her view over 20 years, according to her email. And then it's all over. People do that all the time. What have you done for me today? Or did you disappoint me today? Everybody disappoints everybody. Hello. This is a rule of life. Everyone in your life will disappoint you on occasion. It is inevitable. Even your dog will disappoint you. And that's saying something because they're pretty consistent. So when they do disappoint you, what will you do? <coughs> Excuse me. Will you say, oh, that's it. All, all, all the wonderful things this person has done for me in, 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 in all of our years together matter not at all because today she or he disappointed me you will remain friendless and not to mention have no more marriage if it if it's your spouse you're talking about all of this the antidote is gratitude and then you could say okay so in light of that i have disappointed my friends i have no doubt and my friends have disappointed me and i love them and there, and when, if there is a disappointment, I just chalk it up to the fact that even my friends are human beings. Humans are frail. Humans have flaws. Even my wonderful, wonderful, wonderful friends, and even I. And so I, what I do is I balance it with, oh my God, I'm so grateful to them. Their friendship over these years has meant so much to me. That's, that's the power of gratitude. You don't have it, you're, you're a loser. You are literally a loser. You lose at life. And we are cultivating ingratitude in the United States. See yourself as a victim. You're a member of a victim group. Woe unto me, woe unto me, poor me, poor me. It is poor you because you're going to lead a miserable life. Everything good is a value. If you rely on your human nature to guide you, you're screwed. And I'm using a stronger word. Well, it's not, there's a stronger word than that, but I can't use it. Okay. That's, that's how important it is, but you've got to cultivate it as a value. You have to understand how important it is. You can't rely on, well, I feel grateful. It doesn't matter. You feel grateful. You have to be grateful. I don't care how you feel. You've got to be grateful. You have to express gratitude. Who have you thanked lately? That's a good question. Who have you thanked lately? So there it is, gratitude. Uh, there are parents who tell me that every night, if they have dinner every night with their kids, they have them say something they are grateful for that happened that day. Those kids are very, very lucky least try to do it once a year on Thanksgiving. What are you grateful for? 
be an interesting discussion around the table. And if your ingratitude outweighs your gratitude, you're not a nice person. Now, you may not want to be a good person, but I'll bet you want to be a happy person. But you can't be that either if ingratitude outweighs gratitude. Okie dokie, it is time for your questions. All right. Whoa, okay. Hermann, 16 years old, Iceland, a Prager Force member in Iceland. I had a great time visiting Iceland. Just want you to know. Would you like to give, by the way, it's the most secular country in the world, if I'm not mistaken. And it's an interesting question what effect that will have on the Icelandic people. Would you like to give a lecture on liberty in Iceland if offered? I would love to come back. Does that answer you? Maria, 16, in Peru. Also, Prager Force in Peru. Hi, Maria. Hi, Dennis. Hi. I find it very difficult to argue about abortion because most of the most compelling arguments I've heard can't be used in my country's context. For example, Ben Shapiro says becoming pregnant because of rape is not common at all. But here, it's not rare, especially in the poorest parts of the country. The youngest girl to ever give birth is Peruvian. I think she was nine. What an interesting little factoid. By the way, there is a lot of rape uh, in Latin America. And I know that. And there were a lot of great people in Latin America. That's a given. I've been to most Latin American countries. I love going there. But to deny that this is true is, doesn't help anybody. It helps the left with its myth that all cultures are identical. But it doesn't help the victims. These are real victims. It doesn't help to prevent this from happening. If you go to the doctor, you don't want the doctor to tell you you're well if you have a health problem. The pro-choice always use the argument about how so many girls drop out of school because they get pregnant by 14. Some girls just drop out because they are afraid to get raped on their way to school. It's, a, it's an amazing, this is an amazing little email. Given the circumstances, how could I argue against abortion? I, I, I agree with you. I don't, I don't think that saying that being adamant that that someone who has been raped the woman who, or your girl who has been raped should not have an abortion is going to be the most effective way to make the position about the worth of a human fetus i agree it's it's it, it's emotionally the most difficult point uh, of any of us who want people to understand that the creature that is made by sexual intercourse is, is infinitely valuable. I, I fully acknowledge it is, it, it is our most difficult hurdle. And it may, it's not a point that I, I even push. In America, certainly, where there is per capita, I believe, considerably less rape than what you describe, it is pretty rare. And it is not good to use rare circumstances to make generalized principles. In general, a woman who seeks an abortion in the United States had voluntary sexual intercourse. She was not raped. However, having said that, see my video on, on the worth of the human fetus or the, 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 the unborn child, whatever you, term you wish to use. I don't care about the term. I care about the morality. And I don't talk at all about legality or non-legality. And I open up the video talk. I just talk about one question. The worth of that which is produced by the union of egg and sperm. Is it a pimple? 
Is it a nascent human life? Is it a full human life? What is it? Rape does not change the worth of that creature. Now, that doesn't mean that I would force a raped girl to have a baby. But I can't, I can't change truth because of the terrible circumstances under which the truth operates. If, if, the human, if the human being inside a human being has value, it has value in any way, shape, or form it was made. That's, that's, that is just honesty. What, what is it? The, the, the human fetus has infinite worth if it was produced out of love, but if it was produced out of rape, then it has no worth? It, it, it's, that's not logical. The, the issue is not God. The issue is not religion. The issue is just logic. So th- that's, th- I'm being as totally honest with you. I admit it is the toughest of the, of the hurdles in, in the pro-life world. I, I acknowledge that. And I wouldn't push on it. I wouldn't say, I'm going to force you at 14 to have a child. But if you ask me, is what you're carrying infinitely precious? Yes, even though it was disgusting the way it was made. But that's true for a born human. What if a, per- a person, what if, what if the person is allowed to be born? Would you say that, would you say that a, 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 ten, a, a, a 10 day old that was produced by rape is less valuable than a 10 day old that was not produced by rape? Of course not. So why does it change depending on the date? That's, that's the honest, logical, moral, even atheist answer. I have not invoked God. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, and I'm sorry that these situations are so common where you live. By the way, there are so many people in the first world, especially the United States, who would like to adopt babies, newborns in particular, that maybe there just ought to be a way to say to, to this, this poor girl, you know, we're not forcing you to give birth, but we would like you to know what the preciousness of what you're carrying and that you could make some wonderful husband and wife unbelievably happy and give that child happiness by, by offering the child for adoption. One of my children is adopted. There is zero difference between a biological child and an adopted child. Zero. Okay, just a thought. Jacob, 18, California, also Prager Force. Nice. Which president do you think had the biggest impact and why? Franklin Pierce. I'm kidding. I just wanted to see how you'd react. Because most of you are thinking, Franklin Pierce, who's he? This is no knock on Franklin Pierce. He's not well known. I just took an obscure president and thought I would say something silly. Uh, it's it generally considered uh, between uh, Washington and Lincoln. Uh, a, a great case could be made uh, for either one. Washington is really the father of America. Uh, He's walking away, not allowing himself to be a king or anything like that, not be re-elected and re-elected, he, and, and, and so much else about him. And, of course, Lincoln was, a, was just a giant in, in the way he ultimately won the Civil War and then tried to put the Union back together again. They were not the only ones who had big impacts. But uh, those would be the two that come to mind. Elise, 45 years old, Rancho Santa Fe, California. Our oldest child is 17. We go to synagogue weekly, but he hates going. Doesn't believe in God 
and wants nothing to do with Judaism. We don't fight it anymore. We always have articulated our values and talked about the importance of morality. He is not a rule follower. In fact, he is one of the most creative rule breakers. How do we respond to him, and what more can we do? Your son sounds exactly like me. I hated going to synagogue, and uh, the I was bored out of my mind. So I get it. I understand the issue. It's a very tough, there's no perfect answer to this. I don't like forcing religion, but on the other hand, I don't like not forcing religion. Because you force school. What if your kid said, you know, I can't stand school. He's in high school, I assume, at 17. You know, Mom, Dad, I can't stand school. I don't want to go to school. Now, you would say, I'm sorry, there's no choice. Now, why is there no choice about school, but there is choice about synagogue? Because we think school's more important. We're not afraid that if we force them to go to school, they'll hate learning. Why are we afraid if we force them to go to church or synagogue, they'll hate God or religion? I don't know. Maybe there is a good reason, but I don't, I don't, I don't know what it is. I was forced to go, and I couldn't stand it, just like your son, and I ended up going my whole adult life to this day. Because as an adult, I came to realize how important it was. Now, uh, there may be a good argument. Maybe there's a compromise every other week, or I, I, I don't know what to say. What else do you do on the Sabbath? Is it, is, it, is, is, is it a general loving and warm religious environment, or isn't it? I don't know what else is coerced, but I was a rule breaker too, and I totally identify with it. If I could speak to him, I would explain to him the importance of all these things. At 17, everybody's an atheist. <laughs> Let's be honest. I mean, I'm, I'm overstating it. They were believers, but, you know, it's, 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 it's a totally natural, and I'm not putting it down. That's why you have to answer it. You know, make it clear that if there isn't a God who said, do not murder, murder isn't wrong. I know it'll drive him crazy, and he'll scream and fight, but you have logic on your side. Who says murder is wrong if there is no God? The state? Your conscience? So what? Anyway, we've done videos and books on that, and good luck. Jacoby 13, Holiday, Florida. What's your favorite type of cheese? Certainly do get a variety of questions, I'll acknowledge that. Actually, sheep cheese. What else can I say? I love it. I love most cheese. I don't, I don't like the smelly French cheeses. I admit that. A little too strong. But I love cheese. There are not many people who don't love cheese. I think that's fair to say. But if you haven't tried sheep cheese, it's, it's, it's special. Thank you. Uh, what's our time, uh, folks? 33. Oh, all right. Then let's keep these for next week. It's good to end on sheep cheese. Uh, it was one of, when I took uh, speaking, they said, try to end every talk with something about cheese. And, and, uh, and it worked out, it just worked out perfectly today. Hey, it's great to be with you. And keep those emails coming in. Let uh, friends know about this. Some pretty important stuff that uh, I get to talk about with you. So have a wonderful holiday, specifically in this case Thanksgiving. By the way, if you're watching this and it's in the middle of summer and it's not Thanksgiving, it, none of these are dated. When I talk about these things, even if it's in the news, my, I'm always thinking if somebody watches this five years from now, will it be relevant? My hope is that it will be. So thanks again. From my house to yours, I'm Dennis Prager. See you next week.